So far in this series, we've seen how scientific research has clarified and improved our understanding of drug abuse. We've discussed genetics, brain chemistry, the effects of drugs, and described the reward model of addiction to provide you with a more complete explanation for the progression, symptoms, and consequences of substance abuse. As a result of years of scientific and clinical study, we no longer think of drug abuse as being the result of weak character or poor morals, but recognize it as being the result of a variety of biological and environmental factors. As we have discussed in earlier programs, the reinforcement model of addiction views drug abuse as ultimately arising from the reinforcing effects of drugs. In this program, we're going to take a closer look at how this understanding of substance abuse as a biologically based disorder can give treatment providers new options and better insight into their clients' struggles with drugs. Until the 1970s, our best explanation for substance abuse was the dependency model of addiction. It proposed that chronic, heavy drug users were physically dependent on their drug and continued to use drugs to avoid the discomfort of withdrawal symptoms. As a result, only those individuals who were physically addicted to a drug were considered drug abusers or addicts. While this model helped to improve treatment for many drug abusers by removing some of the moral stigma of the disorder, the dependence theory left some important aspects of substance abuse unaccounted for. For example, it could not explain why someone would use enough of a drug in the first place to become addicted. Because the dependence model viewed physical addiction as the key factor in considering whether someone had a serious drug problem, many individuals were left untreated because they were too early in their addiction process to be diagnosed as drug dependent. Another important factor was that, unlike heroin or alcohol, which cause easily observable and severe withdrawal symptoms, many other drugs, such as cocaine and marijuana, have withdrawal signs which are less easily noticed. And as a result, many people addicted to these drugs did not receive sufficient attention or treatment. By the time they were recognized as needing treatment, many drug abusers had already progressed to a state of severe physical and emotional crisis. While researchers wanted greater scientific understanding to guide drug abuse treatment, clinicians had other concerns. They realized that many of their clients with drug problems were suffering severe consequences long before becoming physically dependent. The reinforcement model of addiction addressed the concerns of both groups. It provides a scientific basis for the addiction process while also offering scientific support for many traditional treatment approaches. It also explains substance use and abuse in terms that can include, but do not require, physical addiction. The reinforcement model of addiction draws upon decades of genetic and neurobiological studies and has dramatically changed the way we both view and treat substance abuse disorders. The reinforcement model says that people use a drug because in one way or another, it makes them feel better. Sometimes feeling better involves looking for a good time, and other times it means trying to avoid bad times. The reward pathways occupy center stage in providing an explanation of the biological basis of substance abuse. Understanding the function of the reward pathways can help to explain some of the lifestyle changes that are important to recovery. Clinicians have long observed that people who develop one addiction tend to have difficulty moderating other potentially addictive behaviors. We now know that the reward pathways are involved with all our feelings of pleasure, regardless of their source, and are a common biological component to all forms of addiction. The reward pathways may represent the biological reality of what has sometimes incorrectly been called the addictive personality. This may explain why recovering substance abusers frequently experience problems moderating other rewarding behaviors, such as gambling, eating, and sex. Taken together, all of these facts provide a biological basis for calling drug abuse a disease and validation for some therapies which were once dismissed as folklore. In addition to providing explanations for the effectiveness of some traditional treatment approaches, 
The reinforcement model can also suggest new treatment procedures that can be implemented much earlier in the progression of drug abuse. Because traditional treatment approaches were originally developed based upon similar programs with alcoholics who had hit bottom, they tend to focus on the negatively reinforcing effects of drugs, using them to avoid feeling bad. Fortunately, we no longer wait for a person to become physically dependent upon a drug before identifying them as having a problem. As a result, more and more substance abusers are now being treated long before they hit bottom. This earlier diagnosis has been referred to as raising the bottom. Now, most drug abusers receive treatment before they have developed severe medical problems, which can often improve the individual's chances of recovery. In general, research shows that treatment guided by our understanding of the reinforcement model and the neurobiological basis of addiction is more successful than confrontation-based approaches. A new approach to drug addiction was born with the introduction of methadone as a treatment for heroin addiction. Interestingly, methadone, like heroin, is an opioid agonist, that is, it stimulates opioid receptors in the brain. However, it is much longer lasting than heroin, and there is much less of a rush or high associated with its effects. Because of these differences, methadone can be taken easily in a clinic or at home, and needs to be taken only once a day. Given what we have learned about cues and triggers and cravings, it is clear that methadone offers advantages over continued heroin use. It allows the heroin addict a chance to take an opiate drug, but away from all of the environmental and behavioral cues that intensify cravings and that are part of a dangerous and unhealthy lifestyle. For example, sharing needles and purchasing street heroin. However, methadone has disadvantages as well. Most notably, that it is itself an addictive opiate drug. So while a person in a methadone treatment program may be able to alter and improve their lifestyle and break their pattern of drug-related behaviors, they can still be addicted to opiates. This has been a controversy for many years. Some providers have argued that long-term use of methadone is not a problem if a person is changing and normalizing their lifestyle and that gradual withdrawal from opiates should come only when the patient is ready. Others have argued that the goal of any treatment program should be detoxification and a rapid progression towards abstinence, and that methadone can interfere with this goal. Many years of experience with methadone treatment programs has shown that there is validity to both of these positions. Many heroin addicts have successfully used methadone as a way of altering their drug-taking lifestyle and gradually reduce their methadone dose until they were drug-free. Others, however, have come to abuse methadone in ways similar to other drugs. What seems clear is that methadone is probably a good choice for some opiate addicts, but not others, and that whether or not methadone is used, a strong treatment program that deals with all aspects of addiction is critical. More recently, a second medication was approved for maintenance treatment of opiate addiction. This medication is commonly referred to as Orlam or LAM. Like methadone, it is approved for treating heroin and other opioid addictions through outpatient narcotic maintenance programs. Methadone and LAM are oral narcotics that work in the body much like morphine does. Both medications can produce dependence, but when taken as part of a maintenance treatment program, they usually do not cause euphoria. Instead, they can actually block both the highs and the withdrawal symptoms of other opioid drugs like heroin. LAM's advantage is that it only needs to be taken two or three times a week, compared to daily for methadone. With fewer required visits, patients have an even better chance to return to a more normal existence, and clinics can treat more patients. Used only in a treatment clinic, LAM is not allowed in take-home doses. This also reduces the likelihood of patients diverting the medication to street sales. Some caution is needed with the use of methadone or LAM. Both of these medications can interact with tranquilizers, some antidepressants, alcohol, and other drugs. They can worsen low blood pressure and asthma, 
and they can sometimes cause breathing difficulty and impaired circulation. Less serious but still uncomfortable methadone side effects can also include dizziness, vomiting, and sweating, while lamb can cause flu-like symptoms, diarrhea, and muscle aches. However, if the goal is to reduce drug abuse, a properly administered maintenance program does appear to be the most effective treatment. Patients receiving maintenance treatment have a death rate 10 times lower than untreated addicts and an incidence of needle sharing three and a half times lower. Another new medication for treating opiate addiction based on the reward model has been used successfully in clinical studies and is awaiting final approval from the FDA. This medication, called buprenorphine or buprenex, is effective at blocking heroin's euphoria and associated cravings for heroin. Many studies support the safety and efficacy of buprenorphine for the treatment of opiate dependence. Interestingly, a combination medication of buprenorphine and naloxone is being developed as an effective pill for treating opiate addiction. This combination pill is based on the fact that although buprenorphine alone taken as a pill may block heroin's effects, the injected form can produce euphoria. However, injected naloxone blocks the euphoria and induces withdrawal. This approach is quite clever. The idea is that if the medication is taken as prescribed, the naloxone won't have an effect. But if patients abuse the medication by dissolving and injecting it, the naloxone effect will predominate and it won't be very reinforcing. Sadly, it is estimated that more than 50% of individuals addicted to opiates such as heroin are also addicted to cocaine. Recent studies have shown that a combination of buprenorphine and antabuse, a medication usually used for treating alcoholism, may be effective in treating those addicted to cocaine. Clinical studies suggest that taking antabuse prior to cocaine may block the pleasurable and rewarding effects caused by release of dopamine in the reward pathways after cocaine use. Using whatever means works, we know that keeping patients in treatment is directly linked with improving their health and social productivity and with decreasing their drug abuse and criminal activities. We also know that patients stay in maintenance programs at a rate five times higher than that of individuals in other outpatient programs. While there is no cure for drug addiction, there is hope for recovery from heroin addiction through narcotic maintenance treatment programs. Using legal oral synthetic narcotics, maintenance programs wean addicts off heroin, the first step to stable, productive lives. There are currently no medications available for treating addiction to cocaine, PCP, marijuana, methamphetamine, and other stimulants, inhalants, or anabolic steroids. But as you watch this program, many researchers in laboratories and clinics around the country and around the world are working to develop medications useful in treating cocaine and other substance abuse disorders based on our knowledge of cravings and the reward model of addiction. As successful as some of the recent results have been, not all studies have shown treatment medications to be equally helpful. For example, like methadone or LAM, Buprenorphine is most effective when taken by individuals who are also participating in other forms of substance abuse treatment. But despite more than two decades of documented success of maintenance therapy, the idea of treating addiction with addictive medications is often viewed by the public and by many treatment professionals with suspicion. One source of this uneasiness is a misunderstanding of the addiction process. Many people still don't realize that drug abusers must fight their addiction all their lives. Others equate patients in maintenance programs with street addicts. In fact, the patients are at some level of recovery, which benefits society as well as the patient. And for some individuals, treating a drug addiction with another drug is a highly controversial and unacceptable notion that just defies reasoning. One major reason for this may be due to the mistaken belief that these medications are intended to replace the necessary lifestyle changes that form the core of many traditional recovery approaches. In other words, why would drug abusers work to attain a drug-free lifestyle when they can simply turn to a quick fix like buprenorphine? This argument is unfounded because these medications are not intended to be the exclusive source for recovery. 
Buprenorphine, methadone, or LAM are intended to be merely just one component of a comprehensive program that includes counseling and group support, among other possible forms of treatment. The reinforcement model, combined with our knowledge of the neurobiology of drug abuse, provides more than just an understanding of how medications like buprenorphine work. This information can also help treatment providers to shift their emphasis toward interventions that now have a clear neurobiological basis. To successfully recover, drug abusers are faced with several daunting obstacles. They have to learn to substitute non-drug-related positive reinforcers for their drugs. They need to conquer their cravings by avoiding the people, places, and activities they associate most with taking drugs. And they need to find alternative coping strategies for stress and emotional pain. Substituting non-drug positive reinforcers in the place of powerfully reinforcing drugs like cocaine or heroin is a particularly difficult challenge. If an early problem drug user progresses to chronic abuse of drugs, they have probably already substituted most of their healthier activities for those related to taking drugs. As a result, substance abusers make their drug their number one method for stimulating their reward pathways. Because drugs of abuse are such powerful, reliable, and almost instantly gratifying reinforcers, recovering abusers struggle to replace them with other less pleasurable alternatives. Therein lies one of the major barriers to recovery for a drug abuser. To succeed, drug abusers have to face the fact that it will take a considerable effort to stimulate their reward pathways using healthy alternatives. They may have to accept the fact that most healthy reinforcers may never feel quite as intensely pleasurable as their drug. As discussed earlier, many drug abusers develop behavioral addictions. This is because the substitutes they have chosen for their drug are other highly effective methods of stimulating their reward pathways, such as eating, gambling, and sex. We have also discussed the nature of cravings. Because we know that cravings stem from the brain's anticipatory response to cues associated with familiar drug use situations, drug abusers should avoid the people, places, and activities they associate most with taking drugs. Because some drug abusers take drugs to cope with stress and emotional pain, the brain also learns that certain stressors or unpleasant emotions signal a bout of excessive drug use. Therefore, stress and emotional pain can also trigger anticipatory responses that are experienced as drug cravings. Because these are slippery places that we carry around inside us, learning new methods of coping with stress or emotional pain plays a central role in the treatment of substance abuse. In the last two decades, there has been a revolution in our understanding of substance abuse disorders. Our knowledge of the neurobiology of addiction and our understanding of the reinforcement model has redefined substance abuse as a brain-based disorder. Understanding the role that the reward pathways play in substance abuse is leading to the development of effective new medications to reduce cravings and allow the drug abuser to regain a more normal lifestyle and avoid places that can trigger cravings. Knowledge of the reward pathways has also confirmed the importance of several treatment approaches. We see the need for a recovering substance abuser to substitute healthier non-drug-related reinforcers. We now understand the science behind the need for drug abusers to avoid the people, places, and activities they associate most with taking drugs. And we now understand the scientific basis for why drug abusers need to learn alternative ways of coping with stress and unpleasant emotions. But perhaps the most important thing that we have learned is that whether it's medication, behavior modification, or other psychosocial treatments, there is still no single answer to the complicated problem of drug abuse.